Well, hello everyone, and welcome back for another webinar for the Earth Regenerators series. Uh, I'm your host today, Joe Brewer, and I'm excited to have you all here. I see that more people are joining us as we uh, get started, so we might wait uh, two or three minutes until we start the formal part of the webinar. In the meantime, if everyone who's joining us would like to well, say hello and introduce yourselves in the chat box, as other people are already doing, then you can um, get to know who else is here. I actually see quite a few of my good friends uh, in this list of chats, so I'm feeling welcomed and loved already by people that I know very well. Um, today we're going to be talking about bioregional regeneration through the lens of education. And this is something that, for those of you who followed my work, you know that this is something I care a great deal about and I'm really excited to talk about. So um, as we prepare to get started, let me just share that the basic format will be that I'm going to give 25 or 30 minutes of presentation with some slides and then we'll have an open Q&A and general discussion that comes after that. So this webinar is structured in two parts. And one thing to let you know right off the bat is that if you go to the bottom of your screen where it says ask a question, you have the ability to type in any question that you like that we can address together. And during the Q&A session, Crowdcast lets us have the ability to invite the person who asked the question into a shared video screen. So if you've asked a question, you have the option to, um, when I start to answer the question, I will invite you into a video conversation and you can either choose to accept that and come into the video session, which is being recorded, um, so that others can see this afterwards, or um, you can decline their request to join the video call and just let me know in the chat box that you're not going to join so that uh, I know that you're declining to be in the call in a video presence. But this is just a way that we can increase the uh, interaction and dialogue and let the people who ask their questions um, elaborate on them and we can have some face-to-face -face discussion using the tools of Crowdcast. Also, for those of you who, uh, whether you submit a question or not, just to let you know that you can also go to the Ask a Question box and you can vote questions up that you would like to see answered. And we will address the questions in the order of their popularity among the participants. So this is just a, a little way that we can prioritize the conversation around what the majority or at least a larger percentage of people would like to talk about. And just in case you uh, are wondering, in the background, you might occasionally hear um, my wife and my daughter because they're preparing for a birthday party and are making some homemade Play-Doh. And so, um, so my daughter is in the background wanting to participate and you might hear her from time to time. Um, but that's just how it goes. We are families doing everything we can to regenerate the earth. And so we do it all together. So let's get started then. Um, for those of you who don't know, this webinar series is part of a study group called Earth Regenerators that if you haven't joined, I want to personally welcome you to join. The study group and these webinars are completely free, so they won't cost you anything to participate. And I'm offering all of this in the spirit of a gift economy. So anyone who likes to support me can find my Patreon account um, to, to give a little gift to say that they like what I'm doing. But really, I just feel like these conversations are so important that I don't feel it's appropriate for me to charge for them. I just feel like we need to be having these discussions urgently and seriously. And so I don't want the inability to pay to get in the way. And I don't want our relationships to be transactional. So um, with that said, what I'm about to do is I'm going to start a presentation portion of the webinar, which means I'll go into a presentation mode. At any time during the presentation, you can post a question by going to the Ask a Question button at the bottom of the screen. And um, uh, my daughter's not happy. Oh, I hope she's OK. And just uh, so you know that you can ask questions there. And we'll start a Q&A whenever the presentation portion of the webinar is over. So with that in mind, 
I'd like to go ahead and start the presentation mode so that we can get into a discussion about regenerative education and bioregional learning centers. So here we go. Let's get started. And I, okay, here we go. Here is the presentation. Okay, so I'd like to begin by saying that the purpose of today's webinar is to really explore the role of education in the regeneration of the earth and specifically introduce a concept that has an interesting history. So it's not my idea, it's just a, an idea that I'm a strong advocate for, which is the idea of creating a global network of bioregional learning centers as a way to scale up and spread out around the planet to have our local regenerative efforts accumulate into planetary scale impacts. So with that in mind, let's get started. I'd like to begin by sharing this graphic that I created a couple of years ago for a, um, a Medium article that I created. And what I said in that article was that we need to make a paradigmatic change to the way that all of the institutions of our societies, every society on earth, we need to make a paradigmatic shift away from mechanistic, reductionistic, extractive models of economics and replace them with fully regenerative models of social institutions that embody biodynamic principles. And the timeline that I put at that time was that starting roughly now in the year 2020, we need to have a set of regional scale demonstration projects to show people how regeneration can be done at scales. So that between now and about 10 years from now, the best practices from these projects can spread far and wide around the planet. So that by around 2030, we have these practices being demonstrated as best practices, imitated and spreading further to replace the dominant paradigm for all social institutions in all societies on earth by, <coughs> excuse me, by around the year 2050. So you can imagine this is a huge, huge design challenge. And the thing I wanna to stress today is that all of these changes in models of social organization and social practice are examples of people learning how to do things differently. So there are implications of education and spread of practices in education to achieve all of this. Now with that said, I wanna remind us a way that we have been framing our goal of earth regeneration within the study group which is to use the planetary, boundary, a planetary boundaries framework developed by the Stockholm Resilience Center, which is kind of an amalgamation of earth system science, showing that there are four critical earth system dynamics that are currently beyond the critical threshold and are destabilizing the planet's um, safe operating zone for humanity. And these four, which are colored in here, with the arrows are biosphere diversity or biosphere integrity, which is the loss of species, the extinction event that's happening, land system change, which is the degradation of landscapes all around the planet, biogeochemical flows, which is specifically the release of phosphorus and nitrogen used in fertilizers for industrial agriculture, and of course, climate change. All four of these together are already in the danger zone we have to keep in mind that we need to bring them back within the safe zone because they've gone out of it. So when we talk about regenerative education, it's in service to this incredibly complex, multifaceted, multi-generation goal. Something that will take decades to get the first one back in the safe zone and possibly up to two or 300 years to fully restore to safety. So this is a really big deal. Now, the other piece that I want us to keep in mind is as we are doing this very difficult regenerative work, spreading biomimicry practices across all of our societies, that the famous limits to growth study is a reminder of a very realistic scenario of what is to come. Now, this is a scenario, it's not a forecast of the future, so we shouldn't use it to make predictions, but we should use it to sober ourselves to how challenging the next few decades are likely to be. 
because this specific computer simulation made in 1972, which has tracked reality with disturbing accuracy, tells us that if we follow the track of business as usual, that there would be a systemic economic collapse beginning in the 2020s, and that by around the year 2030, our population peaks, meaning that the die-off rate has met the birth rate, and that the human population goes into a, a cascading collapse from 2030 onward. So the thing to keep in mind is that this is a very realistic scenario. We can't say that it's the truth, but we can say that it is a realistic and plausible possibility. And as we do our regenerative work in the next few decades, we need to have education capacities, abilities to learn that let us manage incredible complexity with incredible and unprecedented uncertainty during what may be the most difficult time humanity has ever confronted. So we are talking about very big, very serious issues here. So let's continue and get into education. Luckily, to do this work, we're gonna get a lot of help. We're gonna get a lot of help from the younger generation, the small children who are coming into the world right now, who are going to grow up into the middle of this centuries long crisis. In this picture, you can see a group of kids. That's my daughter, Elise, there in the white, uh, that's helping to pull this big piece of bamboo so that they can create a bamboo shelter as part of their forest school that these kids are involved in. And what I wanna really emphasize here is that if we think about education as it relates to all of humanity in the next 30 or 40 years, there's a very important role for small children today for us to think about what kind of education they should have in the next 20 years and what kind of young adulthood they will have in the few decades after. And that some of us, like my family, are experimenting with alternative models right now for how to do this. Do you want to see Elise? Ah, and my daughter is here because she wants to see what we're doing. And so she's sitting here with me for a moment. Hi, Elise. Everyone, this is Elise, if you can see her. Now, another thing that's really important is when we're thinking about designing for re regeneration, what this really means is we need to recreate, not simply create because they existed in the past, but recreate the conditions for living locally in terms of material flows, integrated life systems, and the thriving of families. It's so important that families find a way to live through this transition as we learn how to regenerate the earth. And as much as possible, the children become a part of the learning process. And as my family is learning, as we give our daughter these learning experiences, we give them to ourselves too. So we're learning right alongside the children, which is an important ingredient for our family in particular. So how we do this all over the planet is gonna have unique contextual aspects that are different from one place to another. But this is what needs to happen. Another thing I really wanna stress is that for us to create the learning ecosystems, and I use that phrase very intentionally, we should recognize that all of the pieces already exist and they came into being in the last half century. And what we need to do is connect them to each other in appropriate relationships of interdependence so that the different smaller educational models, frameworks and tools that we know work that are being implemented at various scales in the world today but none of them are being implemented at the large enough scales that are needed. Really? That we need to find ways to integrate and weave them. <coughs> Excuse me. So that we can achieve the larger scale. But every piece that we need already exists. And we're going to see some of that in the rest of this presentation. So let's continue. If all of the pieces exist for how to create regenerative education, the question that I would like to provoke a conversation around is, where are the regenerative campuses? If you look around in the world today, what everyone is taught is that they should go to public schools or to some elite private school if they can afford to, and they should end up getting into a university, preferably one that's highly ranked, so that they can get a high paying job for some corporation somewhere in the world. And that is the model of lifetime development and goals that is shaping education for most people on the planet that either they're already on these pathways or they are desperately trying to get onto these pathways. But as this quote from Bill Watterson reminds us, creating a life that reflects your values and satisfies 
your soul is a rare achievement. Remember Bill Watterson gave us the comic strip Calvin and Hobbes, and he knew a few things about education. He's observing that most of us do not create or do not have the opportunity to live truly meaningful lives. So this model of getting onto the corporate job treadmill is not satisfying people. And in a time of urgent planetary crisis, when we have more meaningful work to do than probably ever before, most of us are being left aside and don't have the ability or the opportunity to participate in truly meaningful earth regeneration. So there's a gap that is of monumental scales. And I think we can safely say that our education systems writ large, they're failing us. They're not doing the job. So we need to think really deeply about how to transform or just bypass and walk away from the traditional educational models in order to safeguard humanity's future. At the same time, there are so many globally distributed networks that are already embodying regenerative education. Now in this image, the map on the top is showing where all of the global, oh, is this the global eco-village network? And it's showing you that there are eco-villages all over the planet. The bottom map, which was created by a man named David McConville for the Buckminster Fuller Institute, is a map of videos that are case studies describing regenerative projects. And it's not meant to be comprehensive because it's one person gathering them. But the point is that there are many networks of existing regenerative projects and learning centers all over the planet. So one of our challenges, as we're gonna continue discussing, is how to bring them together into coherence with each other for larger scale regeneration to occur. And that's gonna be something that we're gonna spend a lot of time working on in the coming years, and it'll be a topic of our discussion for the rest of this webinar. Something I want us to think about is, what do these regenerative campuses do? These learning centers that embody regenerative design and that teach people how to regenerate the earth. Well, some of the things that people might learn are the design principles for regeneration. They'll learn permaculture, agroforestry, how to map ecosystems, how to map My social goodness. systems, how to manage no, complex projects, no, how to participate no, meaningfully in community dialogue, how to contribute to governance and decision-making for participation in the projects that happen, and a whole lot more. So these are the real life skills that people need to learn in the education models of regeneration. And you can see there are aspects of them that exist in formal education today but they're not being combined and integrated in the right combinations. <coughs> Excuse me. So there's a lack of coherence and a lack of integrative capacity that needs to be addressed. But at the same time, there are existing inspiring projects that show the way. For example, these two pictures on the top are from the Los Plateau in China. John Liu is the person who's known for creating a documentary called Green Gold. That, was probably, that came out in the 90s about this, where a very large scale landscape regeneration process was enacted for more than 100,000 100, acres of land. And they, the outcomes are dramatic. On the bottom, you can see Tamera, which is an eco village and learning center in Portugal, where they put in a large scale water retention system on the scale of about 20 acres and have brought a desertifying landscape, a landscape that was becoming desert thoroughly degraded, and they have begun bringing it back to life in less than a decade with a well-designed water retention system. So there are examples like this all over the world, like this group of people putting in a multi-tiered agroforestry project on the left in a place called Rancho Mastatal in Costa Rica, which is another learning center that people could go to to learn these things. So as you can see, the knowledge exists. Projects are being done at multiple scales. And so we're not beginning this work, we're merely taking it to the next level. And that's a really important thing because it's so easy to get depressed by the severity of our crisis and the tardiness and inadequacy of our responses so far. But when we look around, there are seed kernels of cultural practices, knowledge and demonstration projects that show the way for what we need to do. At the same time, our crises are also our opportunities. As this graph shows, this is a map of all the degraded land on Earth, roughly 3 billion hectares of land. 
Any place where the land is degraded is a place where regeneration can be done. So imagine if you live anywhere that is colored on this map, that you could begin restoring the land to a higher level of ecological function. And if enough of us do this, we will materially see the entire map begin to change. And this semantic capacity to connect local action to globally measured aggregated outcomes is part of what we need to do in the design of regenerative education. So that we learn how our small parts are linked to the big parts. And we learn how the big parts get done through the coordination of our small parts, which is a, an element of regenerative education that we're going to need to figure out in the next few years. So I want to share a specific idea that was first articulated in 1983 in a document um, telling the history of a group called the Balaton Group. The Balaton Group was the group that came together to create the famous Limits to Growth Study. It was a, a network of, of scholars, researchers, scientists, computer modelers, economists, uh, people who study ecological systems. And after 10 years of gathering and having meetings at different universities around the world, this is what they came away with. Here are the words of Vernon Rutten, who was an agroeconomist, who is part of the Balaton Group. He said, each ag agroeconomic region is so unique that the concept of transfer of technology, it's irrelevant. What's relevant is the transfer of capacity to develop technology and institutions consistent with the cultural endowment and resource endowment of each region. Danella Meadows, who was one of the lead authors of Limits to Growth and who wrote this history, she added by saying, out of this series of discussions came a vision of a number of centers where information and models about resources and the environment are housed. There would need to be many of these centers all over the world, each one responsible for a distinct bioregion. So what they were describing was after all of the best thinkers and scholars of the period between 1972 and 1983, who were grappling with global sustainability, they found that an essential building block is to create learning centers in each region that is defined in ecological and cultural terms as a unique context in which to create the conditions for living, for thriving. And they called these bioregional learning centers. So this is the idea. Imagine if every ecological context on earth where humans live takes existing learning centers in those regions that already partially operate as bioregional learning center centers, but they take on the regeneration of their bioregion as their mission to coordinate actions within their territory. And then they build a network of sharing from one region to another. This creates a learning ecosystem for how to regenerate the entire planet, place by place, around the entire world. Turns out some people took this idea and started to do it. So this is a project called Ecoversities, which is a network of about 30 alternative universities that exist around the world that are decolonizing the curriculum of formal universities, bringing back indigenous practices, local arts and crafts, historical knowledge of how to live in place, the storing of native seeds, the knowledge of ancestral life ways within each place, and creating coherent campuses for learning about ecological knowledge. And there are about 30 of them right now. Also, if you look at the Global Ecovillage Network, and as we saw from the map earlier, they're also spread all over the planet. And here on the bottom left, this is just in the United Kingdom, where the transition towns have local groups organized for urban uh, sustainability projects, where people are trying to embody these regenerative economic principles ways of living sustainably in a local context in their cities and towns. And the map of the entire world is similarly dense. There are thousands and thousands of these local groups trying to answer these questions. Uh, let's dig in a little deeper. This uh, quote from the top is from Ecoversities. They're focusing specifically on the alternative to formal universities. When they ask, what might the university look like if they were at the service of our diverse ecologies, cultures, economies, spiritualities, and life 
within our planetary home? I think that's a really good question. Part of the answer I have, which is this text at the bottom, relates to the way that we create, a, we create what I call culture design laboratories, which is creating centers for applied cultural evolution in any place, place where people are trying to create social change. So we put in place all that is known about how to set up and manage field sites from standard practices and anthropology, archeology, span biology, and ecology. We treat cities and the bioregions there within and university campuses themselves as field sites for applied cultural evolution research, where we try to understand how cultural evolution brought that place developmentally to the condition it's in now and which aspects of the, the culture could be evolved forward into the future to create a living local economy in that place. And if each university establishes a campus level mission of regional sustainability all around the world, then each university would by default become a bioregional learning center. And if we build and maintain learning ecosystems, creating partnerships of collaboration between governments, associations, civil society organizations, basically anyone doing meaningful work related to the local economy, then we are well on our way to bioregional regeneration. So you can see just by hearing this list that a lot of these institutions and capacities already exist in most universities, in most cities, in most regions around the world. But like I said before, they're fragmented, they're not integrated, and people are not creating life systems for themselves to transform from extractive economics to living in this regenerative way. So with that in mind, let's look at bioregional education. And I am most inspired by the work of Peter Berg, who is from San Francisco. He's a foundational pioneer of bioregional thinking, and he passed away a few years ago. He ran the Planet Drum Foundation and organized curriculum for bioregional education. One of the things that he did is he outlined the first year of bioregional education. And I just want to show you the first three months to give you a sense. The first three months of a bioregional education program, what do you do? You locate and identify native plant species, obtain their seeds, gather them, and plant those seeds. You basically create seed banks and gather together the local knowledge of the ecology of that place. You also map out the watershed, begin to identify the natural landforms, the water bodies, put together available maps, and go and make direct outdoor observations to become intimate and familiar with the landscape where you live. Also, study the arts and handicrafts of your place. Research the existing practices, where they get their local materials, how they process those materials, or if you can't find it in a practical sense today, go to the archeologists and the cultural anthropologists, or if there are First Nations um, communities nearby or that have been displaced from your region, go and talk to them and learn how they have done it in the past so that you can begin to reenact local arts and crafts. And also start mapping everything. Map the landforms, the watersheds, the water bodies, the types of soils, the, um, the degraded lands, the types of plants and animals and their migration patterns and all of the ways that humans interact with these things. You can see how this becomes a foundation for how to live an entire life within a place, which is the whole idea of bioregional education. You also start to ask some really fundamental questions, questions that surprisingly, most people on earth wouldn't know how to answer today. If you ask someone, where does your water come from? Most people don't know. So the question I ask you is, do you know where your water comes from? And if you do, have you ever visited the source of your water? Have you ever walked around and looked at it? Is it healthy? Is it safe? Is the water in danger or at risk from future changes? Is it poisoned or polluted by mining or extractive activities? Where does your water come from? Also, where does your food come from? These are questions that once you start to ask, it's like tugging on a tapestry. It either unweaves everything where it pulls everything into a tight fabric. And so local food systems relate to every aspect of the human relationship to the land in terms of sustenance, survival, and ethical relationship. 
Does our food come from someplace nearby or far away? Can the number of people living here be supported exclusively by the amount of food that we grow now? Or is there some possibility in the future that we could transition to 100% local food production by revitalizing our landscapes? Or do we need to lower our, our population in this specific region through some process that may have very difficult ethical quandaries? Also, are people already setting up land trusts and cooperatives to pull land out of speculative markets which make it unaffordable to grow food locally? Have people created food co-ops and farmers markets and regional food distribution systems? On and on this knowledge goes, and this is an essential part of bioregional regeneration and regenerative education. Also, where does stuff get made? And I show these pictures because they're from the Escuela del Bosque, <clears throat> the forest school that our daughter's in, here in Barichara in Colombia. And what you can see is that the kids are helping to gather the raw materials, all of the bamboo, to make a built structure, a shelter, that the kids play in as part of the school. So these children, aging from two to seven, these are small kids, are helping build their own schoolhouse. And they see where the materials come from because they gather and they process it themselves. So not only should we ask where does our stuff get made, but how can we co-create with children and parents together these life systems. This is what regenerative education is all about. Another key question is, who used to live here? What were the indigenous people like? Do the indigenous people still live today? Can you cooperate and collaborate with them, gain their trust and spread their knowledge and wisdom about how to live in this particular landscape? Can you learn about which aspects of their culture enabled them to thrive in this place? This is gonna be an essential piece of becoming regenerative, which really means learning to live within a landscape, which by the way also means becoming indigenous to that landscape. If you learn to live in the landscape and you have children and your descendants as they continue to live there, will start to see you as an indigenous ancestor. Just as we look at the indigenous people alive today who did the same thing with their own cultures in the past. So this question of who used to live here is of fundamental importance. And another key question is how should we raise children? In this picture, what I wanna draw attention to is this is my daughter Elise, gently touching the leaf of a plant after I told her that it's dying. So you can see the leaves are turning brown. And what my daughter said as she caressed the, the leaf of this plant was she said, it's okay. Everything's gonna be okay because we're trying to teach our daughter a spiritual ethic that plants and animals in the landscape are our kin, they're our family, and that we love them and care for them. And also we want her to have a healthy relationship to death. And so we're, we're practicing teaching her this. And here she is demonstrating that she's getting the lesson. So what kinds of ethics and spirituality should we teach to children if we're gonna do regenerative education? Now for this one, I wanna first step back and say that questions like this get really intimate and personal about our own families and our lives. But at the large scale, there's actually a lot that's known about how to create economic systems for entire regions. So as we ask these questions of where does our water come from? Where does our food come from? How do we make the stuff that we have? How do we raise our children? How do we learn from and work with the indigenous cultures? Then actually we can integrate them into so economies at the scale of our bioregions, and we become a part of this larger whole. And we've talked about the principles of regenerative economics in previous webinars. Just wanted to name it here that all of these questions might feel personal at the family level, and that's because they are, but they also are part of the question of how do we as an entire people live in this place, which quickly moves to the larger scale. Another thing that I'd like to name comes from the work of Annalise Smitsman, where she studied the systemic barriers that exist in our education systems today. And so if we're gonna to start to build these regenerative economic models, then we're gonna to need to create education for how to be regenerative. And most of our education systems right now are not getting the job done. So the question becomes, what are the barriers within our cultural systems today that keep us from creating these education models. 
here in this picture are some that Anilos has identified. We are blocked in our ability to collaborate or to find coherence between the different projects. Our interdependencies that we need to cultivate so that our survival depends upon each other, which enables us to work together for the long term, well, that is hindered by mechanistic goals and how we measure our success and how we bring in the revenue and the resources to support our local projects. That our ability to be in reciprocal active relationships with all living systems is blocked by the dominant extractive economy that is siphoning life away and parasitizing the entire planet right now. Also that there are distorted information loops. So the information that we need that would tell us how to live regeneratively is not the information that we receive, not in our media, not in our political systems, not in our measures of success in education and careers, like having a higher income or getting a degree from an accredited university. Those are informational measures that do not tell us if we're becoming more regenerative. And there are many, many measures like this that distort the information as we need to make effective decisions in the world. Also, our ability to thrive uh, developmentally as human beings is thwarted and hindered by our learning environments. So I see a lot of kids today watching superhero movies, militaristic violence, and being on computer screens all the time without getting any time in nature. So their ability to develop into ecologically mature, socially capable, emotionally healthy adults is developmentally blocked. At the same time, our capacities for empathy, love, and gratitude is blocked in so many ways. And the last one she names is our responsiveness to pain, which is that when we feel love for something and that thing is hurt, then we are hurt by it. And so this ability to care and act on that care is hindered by our numbness, by our distraction, and by our overwhelm that keeps us from being able to respond to the pain in a healthy and regenerative way. So these are what she has identified as systemic barriers. And you can imagine how education is involved in addressing every one of them. And any education that addresses them is by its nature regenerative. So I just wanted to share also that we're taking a lot of these ideas and we're beginning a process right now with a group called R3.0, which is Re Redesign Resilience and Regeneration an organization that creates uh, maps of ecosystemic change for social transformation. And I've been asked to lead this as the lead author of the blueprint on educational transformation. And we'll be working with Anna Lois Smitsman, we'll be working with other people in the networks that were named before to help identify how to spread education in service to bioregional regeneration. And so this is something that I would just say, stay tuned because there's going to be a lot more. Another thing that I wanted to name is that a key piece of how we do this work is that we need to scaffold the human capacities to do this work, which means we need to take them from where they are now to higher levels. And an important way to do this is named in the book, The Nordic Secret, which describes a German philosophy called Bildung, which you could generally say is the full development of a person across their lifespan and that there are psychological models of human development that are useful in helping us understand how to move from lower levels of psychological functioning to higher levels. For example, as listed here, increasing our sense of belonging, increasing our, our search for and support in searching for purpose, helping us better understand how to connect with nature and understand who we are, as we develop our conscience and our mental complexity and our emotional maturity, which makes us more ethically capable and responsible as human beings, and also enables us to work better in groups. So the thing to learn here is that there is a lot that is now known about how to cultivate these capacities in human beings. And a big part of regenerative education is going to be the enactment of this knowledge in children, young people, and adults. Another thing that I wanted to name before we wrap up the presentation part of this discussion is something that I'm gonna draw from the work of Michael Dowd, which is an observation he's made, he's made from his wide readings of the role of religion and spirituality in cultures that either become sustainable or that become self-destructive. And what he's learned from studying a lot of other people's work is that 
we cannot have a spirituality or ethic that is separate from ecology. And here he personifies nature as though it's God, as just a practice in doing this. And so he says things like, thinking you could worship any kind of a God without honoring its true nature is idolatry. So this includes the soil, the forests, and everything you depend upon in an ecological sense. We need to move away from our human-centered theologies and come home to our ecological embeddedness to reality that we are part of the earth. And this is something that's really important because surveys of cultural anthropology and archeology span reveal something very enlightening and very disturbing, which is this. Did you know that all civilizations and all empires in history have collapsed? Every one of them. And the reason is that they failed to recognize the ecological limits embedded within the human relationship to nature. And if you read any of these three books, The Stable Society, The Either Way, An Ecological Worldview, both by Edward Goldsmith, or Overshoot by William Catton, you'll see that the role of spirituality in creating sacred relationships to the ecosystems that people depend upon has been the secret of sustainable cultures throughout history. And every culture that fails to behave as though its ecological relationships are sacred has self-terminated, collapsed, and gone away. So there's a very powerful lesson, <coughs> excuse me, a very powerful lesson in this for all of us. So if we're gonna do something like regenerating huge swaths of the earth, where here you can see all of the Middle East, which used to be called the Fertile Crescent, until those civilizations that collapsed, they degraded much of this land and turned it into deserts. If we're gonna regenerate things on this scale, then we better learn how to create regenerative bioregional economies. And we better learn how to learn at every scale needed from the way that we teach our children how to love a specific plant as it's dying to how to watch an entire planet as it's dying and how to bring it back to life. And the way we do it is by teaching this, local craft skills, local knowledge, local construction, local material design for how humans live in a specific landscape. These children are learning earthen construction, which is a very common way of building things here in the Northern Andes in Colombia. And it's something these kids, these fifth graders are learning in a workshop I attended a few weeks ago. All children of all ages need to be learning this for us to regenerate the earth. So let's talk. Um, I uh, invite anyone who hasn't to join our Earth Regenerator study group, and I'll end the presentation portion of our session right now so that we can get back into a discussion. So thank you all for being here. I really enjoyed um, having these conversations. And I wanna just remind you that the way that it's gonna work from here on out is that there's a, bo a button at the bottom that says, ask a question. And anyone who uh, would like to ask a question can pose it there. Um, you can go to those questions and vote for all the ones you'd like to have answered. And as we start to address them, I will invite people into shared video where we can speak to each other about the question and have a little discussion about it. And just so you know, in the past, we've had some problems with bandwidth on the internet where sometimes this hasn't worked very well. and We've had some technical challenges, but I really wanna try and do it again and hope this works this time. So if you have questions you'd like to pose, please drop them into the question box and we'll start to address them. And so the first question that is right here at the top is by Ben Lee. And so Ben, if you'd like to uh, join the discussion, let me know and I'll invite you now. If you don't wanna be in the discussion, then, um, uh, then just let me know in the chat box. And his question has, has anyone tied coronavirus specifically to the fact that we are in carrying capacity overshoot? And I'm inviting Ben into this, to, onto the screen in case you'd like to join us. Um, but while we're waiting, I just want to say that I want to really stress how ephemeral the coronavirus is as a phenomenon, meaning that I've watched over the years as people have been caught up in three to five day media cycles about things. And right now it's, it's unclear how big of an issue it is going to be. So um, Ben, as we talk about this, let's generalize from the specific coronavirus 
phenomenon to what it represents in terms of system fragility because it may dissipate and turn out to be nothing or it may have a cascading effect. And I think that our ability to have the conversation in general and really be useful would be to connect it as a, an exemplar of the general phenomenon, uh, which I think is a really good learning opportunity. So, hey, how's it going? And who do you have there with you? This is Kinley River. Hi, Kinley. <laughs> At least you want to come over and say hello. At least wants to say hello. All right, baby girl. Hi. <laughs> She's three, right? Yeah. Kinley will be uh, a year in May. Whoa, awesome. <laughs> Hi, Kinley. It's nice to meet you. At least just turned three in January. Did you guys do a home birth as well? We tried to, and then um, there were complications, and we ended up with a midwife at the hospital. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. just as fun. Yeah, that's how it comes. So, yeah, let's, let's talk about um, coronavirus and, well, I would just generalize it to systemic fragility, which I think is a good way to connect the dots. But I'd love to hear your thoughts about what you were thinking with the question, and then let's let's kind of dive in and chat. Well, I think I asked it because it is um, a scary one to, to ask, and, and those are the important ones to ask. Um, there's I've been sort of compiling a lot of diseases that originated from high density uh, states, and I I guess. You know that's that's sort of a rabbit hole to go into, and it may it may dissipate. Um, but I think earlier you mentioned, um, you know, what's you had mentioned in a podcast recently, letting go of the people who are not ready to to handle or or digest um, psychologically what we're facing. Um, so, and this kind of gets into a bunch of other questions, and I, I tend to do that, so if you want to pause me there. And yeah, yeah, let, let's pause there because uh, what, what I think you're referring to is the uh, podcast that I had with, with Jared and Jason, the both yeah, hands. halfway through it. And um, we were talking about techno options and how I might influence their thinking yeah more skeptical or bypass them yeah. and um, one thing i think is really important with the coronavirus as an example is that first of all there is really good evidence that with the invention of agriculture and the formation of longer term permanent settlements the quality of human life went down dramatically yeah. people's lifetimes became shorter they had more diseases there was more malnutrition but their populations were able to survive at larger scales, even if their life was lower. And this didn't change until the invention of medicine after the scientific revolution. And so there's a general pattern there that I'm, some increasing numbers of people know about, but not everyone knows about. Yeah. And so a lot of our, there were no pandemics before permanent human settlements, because you actually needed the population density for the density yeah. of social action, activities to spread as a pandemic. So any pandemic is sort of a structural consequence of human settlements. So the coronavirus is definitely an example of that. And um, another related piece to this, I guess, is like right now we're in a time where there's so much structural interdependence and fragility that the whole thing could destabilize from trigger events that we can't predict ahead of time. Yeah, I think that the, the urge to um vaccinate everything vaccinate every um innovation that nature has in response to our preferences to control death essentially are pretty scary so we'll see we'll see how things unfold <laughs> yeah I mean, one thing related to this is uh the sanitizing of our environments yeah. killing all the organisms and we more. have no idea that's doing to our inner biomes yep. or the evolution of our immune systems across our life chains. I have no idea what that's doing. Um, just as an example of this. So, yeah, I think this is a really important question. And is there anything else you wanted to touch upon before we uh, go on to another question? Um, I think it's a really important discussion. Right. 
Um, so I have a lot of discussions with my family that are pretty compassionate along these lines, and they, um, a good portion of them are not of the um, glimpse into oh, we're in, that we're in ecological overshoot. So um, that's just an ongoing thing to think about. You know, I can't just leave and go to Seattle where a lot of people will uh, share my values, but there's a certain amount of roots that I, that need to be honored, I guess. So I guess that, that's about it. Yeah, <laughs> that's something. Um, yeah uh, maybe while we make the transition to the next question, I'll touch on this one because it's really important, which is how do we transform our own lives? Well, that means we have to give up some things. Like my family moved far away from where I'm from and where my wife is from. So it's difficult for our, us to stay in touch with extended family. So we made a choice. Everyone needs to make these kinds of choices and they're very personal and there's no right answer. So they're just really difficult choices. And um, it's important to honor how, how important they are. To give them the time rather than trying to answer them quickly. Um, just want to honor that struggle because it's something I think all of us are. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but it's great to chat with you and to meet your beautiful daughter. Oh, she's so sweet. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Great to meet you digitally. Bye bye. All right, let's let's jump on to the next um, question and keep rolling because this is this is really good stuff. So thank you, Ben, for that. That's, I think it's a really important question. Um, you can see that we have a question from Jeff McNeely. So Jeff's a good friend of mine. So we know each other very well. Um, and so Jeff is asking. Uh, Jeff, I just invited you into the screen. Uh, is anyone compiling a data bank for storing and sharing all of these bioregional data? Um, oh, I'm sorry, I missed another one that was higher up. So sorry about that. We'll, we'll go ahead and just sit on this one since I uh, ignited it anyway. And Julian, I'll come back to your question. Um, is anyone compiling a data bank for storing and sharing all these bioregional data? Um, so, yeah, I think this is a really important question. In terms of seeds and native species, watersheds, etc. So, hey, Jeff, how you doing? Good to see you. <laughs> I know um, Jeff and I are good friends, so we uh, um, we chatted many a time, uh, including in your kitchen fairly recently before we came to Columbia. Um, love to hear your thoughts about this. Actually, like I feel like you are planting this question because you know how important these databases are. Um, so, I'd like to hear some of your reflections on um, the motivation for the question and what you see as being, uh, you know, places that people could participate in helping to not just answer the question, but do this stuff, actually make it happen. Yeah, hi, hello everybody. Uh, not so much planting as uh, aspiring to know the answer because, you know, from, like the regenerative communities networks and all the other, you know, fragmentation of various groups involved in supporting broadly the regenerative effort. I haven't seen sort of a, you know, an effort to specifically compile data, you know, just keeping track of information in any sort of consistent, coherent way. And as you know, you know, part of my day job is in doing, you know, data analysis and visualization and pulling data together. So of course, that's the first place I go and think about. But, you know, having recently moved to, uh, I don't even know how they say it right, Shakolke, the Whidbey Island, which is the uh, Skagit and Squamish people that lived here and, um, you know, did lots of really amazing things. Like my wife, this past week was volunteering at a, an event where they're um, uh, selling native plant species out and they had a lot of camas up there. And one of the things my aunt told me is that, you know, the uh, Chilicum, the chief that you know was here in this land, you know, would uh, grow camas and then canoe it over to other parts of the sound and, and uh, provide it to other people. And, you know, so like, the knowledge of the native species and which ones grow well where and what kind of care they need and what, you know, like you said, the watershed, where, where the creeks come from, where the fish are, where the 
clams are, where the crabs are, like all this stuff is known by those that are out there harvesting or out there doing the work. Um, many of whom aren't around anymore because you know this other way of life yeah. has um, deemed them expendable and tried to do a different way. So in that, there's there's a lot of like objective data points, just tracking yeah. and knowing. Totally. And, and how do we relating to this? There are two things I'm thinking of relating to this. One is um, how much of this knowledge needs to be embodied in cultural practices which is different from having it in a database. Although a database is a good idea too. It's just recognizing, like here in Body Chara, we started a conversation around a medicinal plant garden to teach people medicinal plants from native species, which immediately led to a conversation of how mothers who have small children, because there are a lot of interior courtyards with gardens, how mothers could just grow these plants and teach their own children how to use them. And then you have the, the cultural knowledges within those families. And the database, so to speak, is the families themselves. And I think that's an important piece of this. And then the other piece that is uh, so interesting is we, we can now aggregate data with dynamic databases so powerfully that it's really about um, how do those people who have the technological skill to build and visualize the databases, make them searchable, make them open access, standardize them and all of this. How can they work with the people who have this cultural knowledge, which is about building relationships? And I see that as um, a natural alignment of opportunity for all of us. <laughs> yeah, truly. And I think the, the trick here is, yeah, there is an embodying factor. Absolutely. But to assume that, like, that that is transmitted only person to person uh, misses mm -hmm. the broader spiritual connection of this whole thing in that, you know, a well-tuned person can come across some facts and meditate on it and intuitively come to the same conclusions that the wisdom was held in prior by other people. So, you know, and I'm just thinking more broadly in, you know, an anti-fragility perspective, like having the data points someplace that is um, immune to, um, you know, uh, death, <laughs> so to speak, that that would be and this could just be as simple as you know carved on a rock as long as it's in a, a way that's decipherable right and so because the, the other fact of that and how we would weave this together into you know a network a global network of bioregional centers is see those those facts about what grows here are not necessarily going to be the same facts about what grows in barachara and what grows in in Sweden and what goes everywhere else, but the sort of the, uh, you know, the accumulated meta about those facts um, are going to relate. In other words, it's not going to be the same instantiation, but there's going to be the same general patterns of behavior within the information that's stored. Yeah. And we could, you know, uh, I mean, shoot, just looking at design patterns from that perspective, Right. If we know that there's these certain factors involved and you go to another place and you learn about a way that they're using it, but they never discovered this third or fourth factor, there might be some innovation to be found in an area just by applying that design factor on what they're already doing rather than teaching them something new. Yeah, this is something that's really important about learning centers being networked with each other is that there can be standardizations that can be done like Here's a great way of doing something. Everyone imitate it for your local knowledge, but you build the same process. Another is that there are standardized, or not necessarily standard, but sequential steps for mapping that can be done. Bring together a multi-stakeholder group, for example, have them um, go through a, an agenda setting process. They create their own agenda, but there can be the same agenda setting process. And so there are things like this that can be learned from place to place. And I, this is where the idea of a bioregional design curriculum becomes really useful. That there's it's shared between the places, and um, and I think that's something that is really needed to accelerate all of this, and is extremely important. So, um, uh, Jeff, thanks for well everything. It's great to just chat with you and say hello. Um, I'm going to go ahead and drop into the next uh, next question, and we'll keep rolling with this. But um, just really want to name the importance of how we learn together from place to place as we're doing all of this work. Because it's uh, 
Um, I think we can really standardize a lot of these things in this in this way as well. Um, I see a question that's come in and has been voted up um, by Julian Wong. Julian is another old friend of mine that I haven't talked to in a while. Uh, Julian, really glad you're here. And Julian, um, uh, I just invited you. So while you're coming in, Daddy. yes, Elise, what is it? Do you want to mm -hmm. get involved in the conversation? I'm having a meeting right now, um, so I don't know if I can talk very no, long. No. What is it, sweetie? Um, mm, I mm, yes. Mm, big baby needs to go pee pee. Oh, she, maybe you should take but, Big Baby to her toilet and help her get her get herself ready and keep her happy. Give her a book to read. And, and she, yeah. Being a parent is a full-time job, as all of you know. Daddy. Um, hey, Julian, Daddy. how's it going? Hey, Joe. It's going well. Elise, do you want to say hi to my friend Julian while we start to talk to him? Because um, hey, we're man. about to talk about how, how to help kids do this work uh, and hey. um, take to the system. So, Julian, hey. Elise, hey. hi. My wife hey. Hey. Remember me? <laughs> um, I don't know if you remember Julian. He came to meet us in Eugene two years ago. Oh. It was a while ago. Um, so Julian, while Lisa's here, we can start talking about this. How do we take this, take this to the kids where the kids are already gathered? Is that what you're thinking? Or are you thinking of something else? Tell yeah. Me I mean, I think the background of my question is simply that lately I've been thinking hard about school design and, and education and curriculum design and to the point where, uh, I feel like, uh, at least part of my plans are to to reimagine what a school can be and, and maybe even build a prototype for it. Um, obviously, this can go in a million directions. Um, and you know, setting is this the setting of the of of a prototype school is is a big question because you can imagine where if you're situating a school, a regenerative school, or whatever you want to call it, green school, in a say an eco village where where it's in the context of a community that is already sort of aligned or moving towards the direction of, of the values that you're trying to promote in the school. Um, that's, that's an easier sell. Um, and then as opposed to a school that is maybe in the middle of a city, right? Where you have a fully flowing marketplace that is very much entrenched in the neoliberal econo economic system, right? And, and maybe you'll check a few parents and, and uh, who, who, who like to send their kids to a different experience, something different, but, you know, that child is still brought up and th those parents are probably having, are still having jobs in the economic marketplace. And, and so the exposure is a little different. Um, so the question is, um, how do you navigate, you know, the, the two coexisting in many ways, diametrically opposing cultures right um on the one hand uh if you have a school setting or 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 even in your family if you're raising kids to live a regenerative life and to 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 promote these values they're getting mixed signals from from, yeah, from other exactly. sources right and it's a constant tension and i i experienced this in my own home whereby uh you know my kids are attending a more traditional type of school unfortunately i hope to change that i'm working on it but clearly the kinds of things and values and lessons they're learning are, are of, of, the, of the different paradigm, a non-regenerative paradigm, right? And, and I see that as like, hey, you know what? The, it's, it's interesting that they define the enclosure movement as the transformation of wasteland into to more productive land. That's a very biased, uh, <laughs> interesting definition. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, I, I don't really agree with that. I think it's more like this. And this is like, you know, what's my, what's my 11 year old supposed to take from that? You know, <laughs> on the one hand, his teacher is telling him something yeah. and, and, you know, I'm telling him something different. Um, but even let's say if you do succeed in creating a very wholesome, comprehensive, full regenerative school, um, and you, you raise your, these, these outstanding kids who are maturing into adults with this, a full set of full sense of regeneration and they're 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 completely in tune of guy and so forth but then the reality is that they're going to go out into the world where things yeah. there's an overwhelming runaway capitalism that we talked about right so the question is you know i, I don't even know how to articulate the question but i think it's where i'm going it's like yeah how do we reconcile that and how do we equip our kids and citizens to to navigate that because it's 
like you said, it's 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 overwhelming, right? The runaway capital, it's it's hard to stop. Yeah. Um, but we're gonna have to adapt to that. So that's one a struggle. Thing that, one thing I think is really important is that there are life skills or competencies is one of the words they use in education, right? Is competencies you you cultivate in the kids. <laughs> Excuse me. It's a really nasty uh, cough that's gone around. I've had it for more than a month now. Um, now everyone in the community has it. That um, these competencies are one way to think of this. Certainly not the only. If you think of like the competency to hold paradoxical views, the competency to remain in uncertainty, the competency to cultivate grit, which is like the ability to stay with something difficult, even though it's difficult, and things that a lot of education has, you know, educators have figured out ways to improve this in students. So there's an aspect of this that's about competencies that can be done in any education system that's working on improving competencies. But there's this other side, which is we need to create an, a very different model of human living as it relates to landscapes. And so one of the pieces that gets really challenging is that education is siloed away from other things as its own issue because of the way we've fragmented so much of our societies. Now, those of us who are whole systems thinkers, we don't silo it, but it gets siloed. And so when we start to put education back in the context of livelihood for the family, then there are these transition pathways. Like um, here in Barichara, one thing we're doing is one day a week of homeschooling with two other families. And what we're experimenting with is how each of us have craft skills that enable us to have a sort of flexible work from home way of living. Like one of the families is running the Escuela del Bosque. So they're doing homeschooling with their kids, alternative education for other kids to make money. The other is a woman who's a fashion designer and she can create alternative clothing and sell them as local apparel, apparel within the shops in town but she can make them at home while she's raising her kid. And here I am doing online teaching and stuff so that I can do this and be with my daughter. So we're experimenting with how do we create an economics of household that lets us live regeneratively, where as much as possible, the education of the child is integrated into it. If we can start to address that, then we're actually creating the building blocks of the regenerative regional economy. Because if more households can do this, then their material flows become local and they're doing local living. So there's this pathway of if entire families and households can move into regenerative models, then they're doing regenerative education as part of it. And education is sort of was never separated, was never reductionistically isolated from it. But still the focusing of, of how the kids learn is an emphasis of importance. We do developmentally appropriate education. So I think this is part of the dance of doing it. And also I remember during the 2009 financial crash, one of the categories of people that lost their jobs was bank clerks. And up until then, people thought if they worked at a bank, they had pretty secure livelihoods. Like what's more risk, uh, you know, what's more uh, risk stable than working at a bank? until all the banks collapse and close their doors and fire all their bank clerks. So there's this thing that the black swan kind of risk pattern is that doing the thing that seems safe because it's normal is actually one of the most risky things. But it's so normalized that people still do it. And they can't perceive risk appropriately to know that it's actually a really bad idea to go to a university to get a corporate job because hmm. that's not a very safe future. Right. Um, so this sort of you know, relearning and unlearning the dynamics of risk as it relates to life choices is something that entire families need to grapple with. And you can imagine how you and your wife might have very different views about that and struggle to make decisions together. And so the scaffolding of how does an entire family make these decisions is I think a focus of design intervention that's really powerful. And it doesn't answer all the questions, but I think it opens up an active inquiry that we can answer some of them. Yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm uh I am I'm, I'm heartened to hear about your your the way you articulated, you know, the education in the context of families and and and, and homes and because um that that reinforces sort of my thinking about seeing community uh, schools as not just 
isolated institutions of learning, but also as playing a central role within the context of community and that school shouldn't, you know, and I, you know, in my ideal school design, a school isn't merely, um, uh, the, 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 the child isn't the, the only student, right? The adults are as much students and, and really the parents too. And, you know, if there are ways you can bring parents to the, to the school to, you know, participate in programs, even in the evenings or weekends or, or with the kids during the weekdays, that's, that's, that's how you sort of, create that virtuous feedback loop between school and community yeah. and what's those norms. So yeah. And also I, I start doing territory scale regeneration. Like we're going to reforest this whole landscape. Then we're going to be talking about regional food systems and agroforestry for uh, for processed materials like paper and clothing and all kinds of things. And having people that work in that craft trade. Well, the parents who are doing that work are now craft trade teachers because they can give workshops to the kids. So there are a lot of ways that the school, you know, I think of it as the extreme flipped classroom. Instead of flipping the classroom where you're on the computer and at home, instead mm -hmm. of in the classroom, we flip the classroom so there's no classroom. Right. The school is the world, mm -hmm. and everyone's learning in the community as the community is part of the world. Right. But you've created pedagogical processes that support the learning. And this can be done very rigorously um, in terms of education design. But then all of the education is regenerative. Mm -hmm. So I think that's another lesson in this. Um, well, Julian, it's great to Thanks. chat again for a couple minutes. And um, let's Thanks, keep Joe. talking about this because my family is living it, and I know yours is too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Try our best. All right. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Julian. Onward. Um, you know, this question of how to integrate all these things and is a really big one. And um, I just want to honor it <laughs> as we continue to the next question, which is posed by Jonathan, um, which is uh, asking the question. So Jonathan, I'm inviting you in and hopefully you can join me. Uh, I wonder, do other countries also struggle with ethno pluralism? As we have a strong public resurgence of fascists and Nazi beliefs in Germany, where Jonathan is based. And um, he says, I ask myself, how can we reconnect people with their land and culture? while preventing racism and ostracizing beliefs emerging from the traditional culture. So um, Jonathan, I'll, I'll give a moment in, in case you're able to join me and we can have a chat about this. And I just want to start by saying that this touches on several other large scale dynamics that are important for us, including that the spread of anxiety creates the conditions for xenophobic behavior, fascism, fundamentalism, militarism. And so we can see the rise in that all around the world. And so this is something that is an active struggle in every political context that this is happening, which is gonna spread to even more places. So um, uh, Jonathan, I'm inviting you in and I'm not sure if you're able to join me, but uh, um, I see you're struggling to connect. Um, so, so we'll see if you're able to get in, I hope you are. In the meantime, just to keep us rolling for the sake of everyone who's watching the struggle, as it were. <laughs> I want to say that ethno-pluralism, or the need to deal with different cultural realities, all overlaid on top of each other. One book that addresses this really, um, really well is Arturo Escobar's book, Designs for the Pluriverse. So I just wanted to plug that one for anyone who wants to read further. Go and find a copy of Designs for the Pluriverse, where you look at the design of ontologies, the design of systems of meaning, where there's a recognition that there's a plurality of those worldviews. Which here where I am in the Andes, there are about a hundred different indigenous cultures that are still intact in Colombia alone, between the Andes and parts of the Amazon. So our reality is that ethnopluralism is fairly extreme. There's a lot of it. <coughs> and one of our challenges uh, that is that we're in a time where a lot of people are stuck in postmodernism, which is a place that goes from critiquing universal truths that actually aren't universal because there are subjective biases, which leads into the pit of cultural relativism, which gets to a place where you can't figure out anything that's true. Everyone's opinions are equally valid, which is a kind of an epistemic collapse of, of meaning making. And the place on the other side, and Jonathan, I know this is something you work with, so I hope you're able to come in so we can chat about it, 
is how do we have rigorous discernment in a context where there are ways of knowing that are legitimate, but those ways of knowing need to respect and appreciate the diversity of points of view, that actually our ways of discerning include the ability to discern our different perspectives so that we can collaborate and co-create. And that's part of the answer to the question as well, which is this capacity to discern increases our capacity for tolerance and also increases our capacity to have nuanced ethical judgment, which is that we can have ethical judgments about what does and doesn't work pragmatically, which is different from ethical judgments about what is good or bad based on moral disgust and judgments of, of my group versus another group. So these kinds of distinctions come about as we increase the building, increase the human development of people toward higher levels of ethical and intellectual nuance, which um, is an important piece of this. So I don't know if Jonathan's going to be able to come in to the call or not. Um, so sorry, Jonathan, that you're not able to, to drop in for technical reasons. Um, I'll just stop answering the question for now in the hopes that um, we can come back to it and, um, and Jonathan can join us. But I wanted to just um, and to continue to keep us growing and invite more people to, to speak with us. And the next question uh, is from Gail Burkett. Gail, I'm gonna invite you into the call. So we'll see if you're able to join me. And we'll, we'll start the discussion where Gail has asked, she says, I'm seeing the link between spirituality and collapse and that there are some indigenous cultures that have survived. And is there the hidden valuing of nature? Is this the connection? How can we, if we're not indigenous, become connected to nature and become indigenous? I actually think this is one of the deepest and most subtle goals for regenerative education. And so, Gail, I hope you're able to come in for us to talk about this because um, this is just so important. So let's start by um, looking at what indigenous means within a, a colonial perspective. Hey, Gail, how are you? I, I can already sense where we're going to go with this. So I'm starting to do colonialism. And how most of us sit within colonialism as we answer the question of what is indigenous. And, um, and I'd love to just start a conversation about any piece of this you want to bite off and chew. It's, it's a really important discussion. So um, what, what, what would you like to focus on in this conversation? I'm doing a little um, lace mark. Oh, nice. Oh, looks like we lost the connection for a second. <coughs> um, well, while, while Gail's coming back in, this point that the term indigenous is actually framed as, as opposed to colonial worldviews that are normalized for most of us. And so um, I think that's a really important place to, uh, I see that Gail dropped out, so hopefully you can come back in, um, which is a really important thing to recognize that a lot of us are in cultural bubbles we don't even know that we're in. And part of becoming indigenous is decolonizing our own minds, which is a whole discussion. We actually talked about this a little bit in the last webinar. Another piece of this is that in order to do permaculture work, and all permaculture designers would uh, talk about this, to do permaculture work, there's this stage of deep listening where you sit in an ecosystem and you just observe its patterns and you learn from them. Well, this way of non-judgmental participation, intersubjective relationship that comes from just being in an ecosystem and listening to it, which is how you do permaculture. That's also how indigenous people connect to the sacred relationships of their worldview. That practice is exactly the same practice. So we can take practices that are functionally the same even though we might do them differently because of our histories and backgrounds. But the function is the same. You are intersubjectively relating to the environment as a set of relationships of yourself to the context. That function is something that indigenous cultures do. So one way that we can start to become indigenous again is to recognize functional roles that we can perform that are indigenous, whether we are culturally indigenous or not and deep listening to an environment is one. There are lots of others that could be named. Another is that creating a coherent life system 
or a way of living in a place is almost by definition what it means to be indigenous. The indigenous people are those who did this and it worked, and that's why they're still here. Their culture didn't go away. And so you could sort of say the cultures that have stayed in the same place for hundreds of years or thousands of years, and they didn't destroy themselves, those are worthy of being called indigenous. They are also regenerative because they continue to survive and thrive for long periods of time. They're self-stabilizing, which means that they have biomimicry principles of dynamic resilience that are inherent to how they work. So they're doing something right. And that all of those are pieces of being indigenous in general. So if we take people who are coming from these post-colonial places and building these systems, these ways of living, they're becoming indigenous too. So um, that's another piece of it. And Gail, I'm really sorry that um, we lost the connection. Maybe it fell away on your end, I don't know. But um, this is super important and is I think right at the core of regenerative education. So um, thank you for asking it. And sorry, we're not able to keep rolling in it together for technical reasons. Uh, this has happened on every call. There have been some technical problems that kept us from continuing. I see that there are a couple of questions left, but we're also gonna run out of them soon. And just like before, I would like to um, create a poll that we can answer. And that is, um, I just posted a poll. So if you get on the bottom, there's a poll. Should we go for the full two hours? So people can start answering yes or no, if you wanna go the full time. Just give a, this is sort of litmus test of the room. Give me a sense as we might start winding up early or we might go the whole time. And of course, anyone who needs to leave at any time is welcome to. But I just wanted to offer this poll as a way of starting to get a feel. And um, another question is, um, is this Q&A format working for you, for you? And so I'm just ask, posing another question to give us the chance. There's a second question, is this Q&A format working for you? I want to get a sense just of um, what we're doing right now, if this is good, if this is a good use of our time, um, because we can start to think about other ways of structuring the next 20 or 30 minutes. So it's looking like most people still want to keep going and the format is still working, um, which means we're going to need some more questions. So um, with that said, let's go back to the questions. And I see that Stephanie has a good question here and it has some good discussion underneath it. So. Um, Stephanie, I'll invite you in for us to talk and we'll see if the technology works for us. Um, Stephanie asks, while families can expend their own resources to provide their children with more regenerative education, homeschooling, Waldorf, or other alternatives, a more just and scalable strategy may to be to transform public education. So could this be done and how? Which is a super important question. So, um, Stephanie, I think I might have invited you and you didn't come in. So I'll just invite you one more time just in case. <coughs> but let me know if, if you're not able to come in or if you don't want to come in. But I want to say, first of all, that, okay, so, so Stephanie's not able to join. Thank you, Stephanie, for letting me know. Um, that uh, if people have other questions, drop them in so we can keep going and we'll have more, more discussion. But what I want to say is, first of all, yes, Work with any education venue you can. Second, as Gail has named it, school boards and parent-teacher conferences and other mechanisms are very powerful for influencing education. Third, there are a lot of teachers who really wish they could do this. And if parents would support them, they could do more. So there's that part. Fourth, um, there are informal educational spaces like local churches, local community groups that can partner with public education for after school programs that can be aligned with the curriculum and what is being taught in public schools. So yes, 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 there are lots of ways to do this. At the same time, anyone who has tried to create change in education will tell you that they've got this big callus on their forehead for banging their head against the wall because changing education systems is slow and difficult and a lot of it is thankless work. So we just want to recognize that education reform instead of education revolution is the more common word, just because it's so hard to change these education systems. And so just recognizing that, which is a really frustrating truth. And so you probably know this, Stephanie, from your own experiences. And so the trick is to hack it, to do as much as we can 
around the periphery of public education and where possible, directly with it. There might be a local nonprofit or a local philanthropist that can support auxiliary education in partnership with the education system that's there. There are a lot of hybrids. And the, the truth is, everything we can do is going to help. So we should be doing it. And I think that's really true for regenerative education. Another idea that I've been floating around is as these regenerative campuses get going, for people who have more money, like say people who have retirements and land and houses in North America, just as one example, or in Europe, for them to pool their money into scholarship funds to support people in doing regenerative education locally, like in Costa Rica and in Colombia, where I've been doing some work, if there was a way to support the livelihoods of children here to do these education models where innovations in education might be easier because public education is sort of more dysfunctional in some ways or is less available in some places, that actually people from privileged places can support people in less privileged places by creating frameworks of collaboration and that there are a lot of ways to do this. So um, anyone who wants to support reforestation, for example, part of that reforestation could be educating local craftspeople and local kids in agroforestry, which also creates livelihoods and jobs for those young people. <coughs> so <it's> just, <coughs> excuse me. This is just an example of how this equity question can be fortuitously addressed. And there's a big conversation about tools, techniques, and frameworks for doing this. But these are just a few. Um, so I think this is really important. And um, thank you for asking it, Stephanie. It's super important. Okay, so um, on to another one of the questions that we have here, which is, um, I'm gonna actually go to the one that Jill has asked because we've already answered, we'll answered one that Benjamin has asked. So Jill has asked the question, with the possible collapse of societies and cap capitalism, uh, and you're welcome, Stephanie. I hope that answers at least a little bit. Uh, Jill, I'm gonna invite you in to, to have a conversation. Uh, let me know if you can join us. So it's with the possible collapse of societies and capitalism, and of course, energy sources, and thus the internet, how are we going to continue to communicate together across the globe to educate each other and share information and resources? This is such a good question. Um, Jill, I hope you're able to join me so we can talk about this directly. Um, yeah, Gal, I'm sorry. Yeah. Gal, baby, um, I, I will invite you in for a discussion after we address this question. Does that sound good? Because I think I have a way that I can invite you into the screen. So, um, uh, and we can riff on it together again because it's a good topic. Um, but for the sake of Jill's question, um, one thing is that there are decentralized mesh communication systems that people have figured out how to set up. And um, it looks like Gail may be joining the call because I don't know, if, we'll see, the technology is weird. Maybe we'll have invited, invited Jill, Gail will also come in, I don't know. Um, Crowdcast is still relatively new for me too, as well. But I wanted to say to Jill that there are two things. One is what Jeff mentioned in his answer about asynchronous um, data uploading, which is that there are ways to asynchronously join, like turn on a generator, so to speak, and communicate information that others that can be relayed, relayed to other places. And that's part of the answer. Another is I remember during Hurricane Sandy that hit New York and New Jersey, that people were able to set up local um, uh, relay systems using cell towers, temporary cell towers, to create a local mesh grid of internet where people could use their phones to communicate within maybe five or 10 square kilometer radiuses. And so it's possible to set up microgrid communication systems, which also can become relay systems. And these things only cost two or $3,000 to put one in place. And so building a network of them is not that expensive for an entire region. So I just wanted to name that there are ways of, um, of setting up communication systems that are relatively affordable um, that can be brought into play even in the extreme case that energy grids and internets go down, which as we know is a very real possibility. So um, I hope that answers your question, uh, Jill, well enough, because I think it's a super important And, uh, and I, I, I agree, it's really important to think of contingency for how we do these things. 
So I see also that, um, Gail, let me see if I can invite you into a call again or not. I can't, no, I can't. Okay, it's like there's a different way to do it. Um, sorry, Gail, we'll just keep rolling. Um, uh, you know, Jeff is asking the question in the chat box about the de degradation of these communication systems. I think one way is to increase the efficacy of our learning in our communities so that the quality of communications is improved and the need for the education or the communication systems is lessened. That um, they need to do more communication systems can do more rudimentary things if the learning and communication protocols of the people are enhanced because education is working. I hope that makes some sense. But um, yeah, 50 to 100 years from now, uh, oh. Well, we've got a long ways to go to prototype your way to that solution. Hi, Jill. Sorry, there was a time delay in getting you in here. Hi. Hello. Yeah. Um, My, uh, I've had a bit of a few problems. Well, I, I could hear what you were saying about um, um, about communicating, but I'm in Scotland just now. Um, and so I was wondering, um, is there anything available that would be able to connect people globally? Um, across the ocean, or do we have to start doing smoke signals and jumping on boats again? You know, this is a really good question because when things go into full cascading collapse, we really don't know how far they're going to go. And one of the important things yeah. will be that even if we lose the ability to, say, monitor the entire planet with satellite remote sensing and these other very technologically complex systems that are really, really valuable, but they may be economically unviable for us, uh, that we need to create, just like they did before all of these uh, tools, create the maps that people <laughs> can just relay and carry from one place to another. So there might be a time delay. Someone may go across the ocean and take three or four weeks to get from one side of the ocean to another with a fairly fast moving boat and then update someone else's maps or someone else's database with information. So it could be that we just have that sort of falling back to a different kind of logistics system that may still be faster than before fossil fuels because there have been some really powerful engineering designs for travel. But um, I think the more important question is going to be as we guide ourselves toward um, regeneration, how can we know what volatile things on the other side of the planet might wreck what we're doing here from region to region, which may not require us to have continual communications, but, um, but might be important on longer term timescales, like setting in motion priorities for 10 or 15 year long projects. And I'm not sure um, how that relates to the question, but I'm curious what your thoughts are, because I know this is this is one of those questions that comes from a place of uh, kind of realizing sort of how fucked we might be <laughs> and, uh, and, and how much our contingency planning, contingency planning needs to prepare for it. So I'd love to hear more of your thoughts and what motivated the question and how we can, um, how we can think together about answering this because I think this is a really, this is not simply a contingency planning question. I think there's a deeper preparedness, a capacity for, preparedness that we might talk about. Um, like for example, how people are unprepared to even think about these deep threats because they're too scary. It's like an example of, we can't even have the conversation with a lot of people. And so I'm just, I'd love to know more of where you're yeah. coming from this, what you're thinking and feeling about it. Well, it kind of, I kind of got thinking about it because I was thinking about um, what you're trying to create um, across in South America and what other people are trying to create in different parts of the world and how it all needs to be um, we all need to be talking to each other to pass on information um, and to, to just keep the whole thing um, going because if, if, if the shit hits the fan and we are living in societies that are very small um, and sustainable how are we going to know that there are other small sustainable societies around? Um, and, and it's all it all becomes very kind of 
um, primitive and stone age again, and um, I don't really know if that's necessarily a bad thing. But I was just wondering about when when there's no more electricity or solar power, or just because of the the numbers of uh, human beings that have disappeared and to uh, who are not able to maintain these things anymore. Um, what's it actually going to be like? It's just yeah. it was just an, an imagination, um, just kind of going with how I was feeling, thinking. I'm just wondering what your thoughts might be on it. Well, one thought I have is that um, before we had all of this global connectivity and high population density, humans did just fine. And they uh, operated as semi-nomadic regional, regional trade networks. Like I spent uh, about 10 years living in the Seattle area where there's the Salish Sea and people traveled up and down the coast and up and down the river systems and had a pretty extensive trade network, which would be similar, I think, in the in the British Isles. If you think of the 3,000, 4,000 years ago, they had pretty extensive trade networks. And so my sense would be that probably those trade networks would become robust, even if there were periods of time where some of them broke down. And so there would at least be regional trade and a communication of information. And we may lose planetary scale. We really don't know. The extreme that I work with is uh, yeah. human extinction. Like, how do we avoid human extinction? And from that place, even if we've lost global communications infrastructure, we still have humans doing their thing. And so that goal, you know, that really kind of high, you know, high bar of, of success, or may I say low bar of success, is still being met. So I'm thinking of this in stages too. Like, we probably have another 10 or 15 years where we'll have quite a lot of technological complexity that we can work with, really powerful communication tools. Now, it might be three years, it might be five years, it might be 15. It's hard to say, right? We don't really know. But, um, but even in some of the worst case scenarios, we probably still have a little more time, even if it's not much. And in the more moderate kind of conservative scenarios, we might still have fairly bad things happen, but they're 20 or 30 years from now or 50 years from now. So we can yeah. still leverage a lot of this infrastructure during that time. And so I think we need to practice not taking it for granted, but also leverage the hell out of it while we have it <laughs> and do the best we can to set things in motion. Um, just as part of, of um, our hedging of bets, as it were, since none of us really knows what's gonna happen. Uh, but but that's, that's part of how I deal with it in my own kind of, like I'm using these digital tools because those are useful. I'm using them right now, but yeah, I depend on them. I'd like to build the the relationships between people that can collaborate with each other that don't depend on this. I think that's a, a goal that we should all have um, in terms of resilience. But um, but yeah, so that that's how I think about it. Um, just being kind of my okay. I, I was wired for optimism, even though I see how how crappy the world is. Uh, that's sort of where I, where I come in. Um, I love that. Does that answer the question or give you a, a, a inform your thinking enough? Is that good for now? Yes, that's good. I do actually have another question, but I don't want to jump in front of other people if they've got something well, else is, they want to is ask. It, is it a short question or is it a big question? Because if it's a short, go for it while we're already here. It's, I, think it's, I think it's quite a short one. Um, have you heard of the seed bank in um, Geneva? I think it's Geneva. Um, have you heard of that? I've heard of one that I think is in Norway. I think there might be another, or in Sweden, but there might be another one. The one that flooded oh, a couple of years ago? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That might be it. Yeah, it might have been in um, Sweden. It, it's one that's built right into a mountain, and it maintains a temperature that's... Um, uh, dormant that keeps seeds dormant, but it uh, doesn't kill them and doesn't allow them to germinate. Um, I was just wondering what your thoughts on on that might be, and with uh, if there was a complete societal collapse, would do you think we'd be able to raid that seed bank? Yeah, um, I, my sense is that projects like that are really valuable, and I'm glad that they exist. And what yeah. I think. Is more important is yeah. bioregional seed banks. 
Like I was at an event yeah. in Pemberton, Washington, so in the northwest part of the United States, that I was at last year, where um, fruit growers just grow fruit trees in their yards, came together to share knowledge about planting apples. And there was a huge regional knowledge of apples. And I think that kind of cultural seed bank knowledge is also extremely important, in part because even in a fairly extreme collapse scenario, some regions will maintain that knowledge. Now, not all of them will, but some will, even in an extreme scenario. So the resilience of human cultures is a network phenomenon. It's like a statistics game. If some of them succeed, then humans succeed. But if none of them succeed, then we're really in trouble. So as many decentralized efforts to create these seed banks and knowledge, the more of them we have, the better we have as a resilient strategy of the planetary scale. So I think the global seed bank is a great idea, but I think it's just as important, probably more important, to create bioregional seed banks. Yeah. What many people already do. So that's just, uh, that's my sense about it. Um, very, very good question. And um, thank yeah, you for being I was just wonder. I was just wondering if um, if we if more regional ones were created, how would how would they be kept safe in an area that had to very that was very? How do you stop all the the, the, the seeds germinating? Oh, well, so the they best hole from the ground and put them in the ground. I think the best answer is to keep them alive in intact ecosystems as much as possible. Like actually cultivating native ecosystems yeah. is, is probably the best thing. Okay. Then you can just go and gather them again, which means all of the cultural knowledge how to do that also needs to be there. And there are people who, in a sort of un underground way, protect this knowledge. Like a lot of indigenous cultures, when they were nearly wiped out, they preserved some of this knowledge by hiding it. And so there's, I think there are a number of levels to strategies for how to do this. And what we need is to do all of them quite honestly, we need to just do all of them. Um, so Jill, thanks for these questions. They're really good and they I think they keep, keep us, uh, um, so th thank you and, and, and nice to chat with you. Glad you're here. Thank you. Um, okay. And I just have asked a question again and then I can finish um, about open education. I feel like the main thing to talk about is the school center. Um, why not create open development models? Um, I know what we're talking about. And there's some of the people in there. So, what I've been talking about is that. Thank you, everyone. Oh, hi. Test, test. Hello, hello. Hey, oh, Stan. Hi. hi. So, see, can everyone hear me okay now that I refreshed? That's the first question. Um, yes. One of the Excellent. Uh, hi, Stan, it's great to see you again. Um, how are you? <laughs> well, I'm really impressed. You know, I think you're doing an amazing job. And I've Thank really you. enjoyed the chats. I think the references are quite helpful that people are posting. I really appreciate it. Yeah, so I understand what you were getting at with your question about the importance of open developer models for curriculum and sharing learning. But I really want to hear from you what you're thinking and, um, and just articulate it, because I think this is really important. So this, this way of co-creating the learning process and our learning systems. So, so tell us more. Well, I was picking up on Julian's uh, question of, you know, how do I do this in my own backyard with my own kids while the formal education system is uh, so biased against my basic belief set around regenerative public uh, collaboration? And this battle was, you know, in a smaller way fought in a technology sense for those of us that believed in open source 
and that software should be free and our kids should be allowed to learn at home on computers with, at the time it was logo, you know, yeah. turtle graphics are very simple. Um, but a lot of those cultural issues started off, you know, in our backyard, I, I was at MIT, my kids are in the AI laboratory goofing around for free. Um, and the big companies were trying to keep us from uh, using that software commercially and defense industry was set up to see that as a cybersecurity threat. And so a lot of those countercultural issues have been fought in a very narrow domain, but I thought it might help you feel confident that your university approach will work because, um, you know, it was Richard Stallman. It was a few yeah. guys and they were hacking, you know, it wasn't uh, funded, but you know, 10 person at a time, those little projects, uh, Linus totaled, they scaled and they scaled disruptively. And I think the magnitude of that is very encouraging. So I just want to pass it along. Wow. Um, you know, now it's 30 million people worldwide. Most of the infrastructure that Gail was worried about is now distributed uh, internationally. And my son, who was in the Peace Corps in Tanzania, was able to talk to us every week, uh, 10 years ago, on a cell phone. He had the battery back it up, you know, and, and the cell phone companies were putting in bio digesters to produce electricity. But, but now there's enough batteries and enough solar. The most solar dense country was like Kenya for quite a while uh, so that they could stay up. And so I think the ability to stay in touch and even my rancher cousins in Montana, you know, they have a very big need to keep in touch with the guy monitoring the sheep herd up on the top of the mountain. It's really a critical, you know, life and death thing for, for him to be able to stay in touch when there's a, a problem. Uh, and so that bandwidth for satellite phones for every farmer now and cell phones for every country, Tanzania, uh, Kenya, all over the world, uh, that really is available and it's getting more and more resilient, like you're talking yeah. about. So actually some of the very best emergency response support was, um, it was open source coded here in Portland, partly, um, but it's yeah. for Africa, for the emergencies in Africa, for the cell phone infrastructure in Africa. And that actually became a global model based on the African support requirements. So I, yeah. I think it's a very hopeful opportunity and I would really encourage you to leverage the lessons learned around openware um, and open source because it is disruptive now that, you know, the very best uh, coding is done by two person groups, you mm. know, uh, somebody checking yeah. the other guy and 10 person, a two pizza team. Yeah. Is the best thing about is uh, related to what Julian and I were talking about, that if families can create regenerative business models for their homes, meaning that if you grow your own food, or if you have friends who grow their own food, then you don't have to pay for food. And so you've definancialized that part of the day. And so there's this way that open source uh, living is living in a gift economy. And actually, Linus Torvald, uh, for those of you who don't know, I know Stan will know this, Linus Torvald, <laughs> Linus Torvald was the person who led the collaboration that became Linux, the Linux operating system. And uh, he came up with what, it, what are called Linus's Law. And Linus's Law is that there are three levels of motivation. Level one is uh, survival needs. If you don't have your survival needs met, you do what you need to do to get your survival needs met. Get your food, get your shelter, so on. You know, like just being alive. And then when your survival needs are met, you go to the next level which he called something like social acknowledgement and validation, which you do things because you want your friends to like you and you want to feel important and you want to feel needed. And so if your survival needs are met, you do things for your friends and family to just feel good and important. And this is because humans are so social. Now, this level of needs are met. So your survival needs and your social acknowledgement needs are met. Then you go to the level that he called recreation, which is you just do stuff for fun. And in his case, writing really powerful software, he's a nerd. It's really fun for him to write really powerful software. So 
So he has no interest at all in being paid for writing great software. He would much rather just have his needs met and be able to play. This way of thinking becomes a gift economy model for regenerative design, that if we can open source how we learn, then we can teach each other how to have sustainable livelihoods, and then we just gift everything to each other, which means that, like, I'm teaching Capoeira here in Barichara. I'm not charging anything for it, but there's a guy that takes my class whose wife makes handmade soaps, so she gives us soap. There's another guy that's taking my class who runs an amazing pasta restaurant, handmade pasta, and he's giving us egg pasta that we can eat from. I'd much rather have that than money. I would pay for that if I had money. So like this way of open sourcing things with the mindset of a gift economy is, is really, really powerful. It allows us yeah. to see in ways we couldn't imagine. And so the just, same way for how do you maintain the community of the assets like the seed bank? There was yeah. a reason why it was called the open seed bank because they were learning from the open source community, how do you create the resilient operating system that all the other stuff stays up on top of? And so I think there's a big effort by a lot of that open source community to do exactly what you're doing, create open seed banks, create the more resilient communication so we can go around all the education systems just by having uh, online courseware available to our kids at whatever age. And my, my grandson is three, he's learning Chinese. And he's watching videos on Mighty Machines, trying to figure out how, how things work. This is not dependent on a school system. And it's a global community that, that he can join in. Uh, yeah. So I am familiar with the green school system. And, I, and we are very active, especially in Cascadia, working with the universities on open source, which is another counter to their, you know, engineering department revenue uh, model. But, but I think part of, the, part of the thing you're doing is really a pattern language. So I know you're familiar and-, and um, Chris Alexander's work, yeah, absolutely. Chris Alexander and Stuart Cowan. Stuart, Stuart Cowan Cowan's. knows all this stuff. And, and the whole idea of building a pattern language for your schooling, for your belief system, very, very cultural centric, uh, is, is very supported with markup yeah. languages. And in Jeff's case, the wiki is a very famous example of doing very small stories in a very structured way. Mm -hmm. So I really would encourage you to try to, like you're doing, this crowdsourcing thing is a very good example. But I think the, you, know, you should have some wikis that allow people to contribute very small stories. And the thing we're doing with researchers is to do map stories. Because there's enough bandwidth now, you can just put GPS labels. And so there's yeah. sort of open data, which is getting to be fairly shareable. But the bad news is you lose privacy. So the other yeah. part of it is the privacy part. And that's the part we're working on now. But 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 there are available map stories. And I know you you were showing me where you find mushrooms up in the Olympics. I, and I thought, boy, my dad would never tell me that kind of stuff. <laughs> that's the family secrets. Yeah, but, yeah. But, but but that is one of the beauties now for any of the hiking and any of the, the tagging. And so people who do endurance things or outdoor uh, tracking things, that's very yeah. much available. So I'd encourage a wiki model. I would encourage the map storytelling. I think that's broadly cultural, uh, shareable. And then I think be glad to help with the, the incubation of the open source cultures to help scale. I think you're doing all the right yeah. stuff, but we could really help you scale. Thank you, Stan. I really appreciate it. Um, cheers. Can I go on? Yeah, cheers. Be well, my friend. Um, yeah, this, this focus on how we can scale things is really important because, for one thing, uh, the, the sort of a, oh, I just realized I didn't start and stop answering that question. Sorry, Stan. Um, so I didn't get time tracking on it. Is that uh, the way we scale this is we scale it the way mycelium scales and we scale it the way bacteria scales, which is, propagation decentrally to many places until it just emerges everywhere all at once. And so um, I think that's a really important aspect of how all this works and the technologies are super important in this. Um, so I see that uh, Jules and, ben and Benjamin both asked questions. Jules, we took out five minutes left, but I'll go ahead and invite you in to answer this one. And I'll jump to Jules' question because Benjamin, we talked a few minutes ago. And Jules was like, could you talk more about regenerative competencies? Oh, he said he can't do the videos, never mind. 
Um, but I'll start answering it though. Talking about regenerative competencies, let me give you a list of regenerative competencies. Emotion regulation, the ability to manage your own emotions. Um, psychological flexibility, the ability to take different perspectives and consider them before making a decision. <laughs> um, trauma recovery, the ability to be hurt by something physically or emotionally and have the supports that you need to recover, which could be social supports or it could be um, personal behaviors and meditation practices that are supports. Um, I would also add um, group learning processes around cooperation, the ability to trust, the ability to work with others, good listening skills and deep listening, especially deep listening, which is when we learn to put our own judgments aside and notice our own tendencies to judge as part of what we're listening to. Um, that's really important. I think um, visioning, future visioning is really important, which is um, that uh, the ability to hold the uncertainty and look into an unknown future and feel what you want come alive hoping to make happen. Because I'm gonna look, I think a lot of us are gonna look at degraded landscapes and imagine them regenerated. Actually, Gil was uh, commenting about that in our text exchange on the Earth Regenerators group earlier today, as she's been dreaming about her bioregion regenerated. Our ability to vision things and letting ourselves dream, that's a really important piece. Also, letting ourselves believe in the future while also being honest about the future. I think. The honesty and authenticity, the validity, the uh, skepticism, together with the ability to dream. Uh, these are all extremely important. And Roberta, my answer is, I don't think they're written anywhere. <laughs> uh, so yeah, maybe I should write them down. Um, thank you for, for posting that. Um, so these are a few. And I think I'll probably hit on a lot of the important ones, but, but there, I'm sure there are more. Because um, I might add others like vulnerability, capacity for intimacy, the ability to be physically touched, and um, ability to touch others. For those of us who have uh, who have physical and sexual trauma, um, is another one that is unfortunately needed. Um, so that's another one that I would add because for some of us the trauma runs deep. Um, so these are these are some of them. Uh, I can see Vivek is like, ooh, I'm gonna write some notes because I know Vivek has been taking great notes. Thank you for, for doing that. Um, so that, that's a few of them. Um, but I see we're getting close to the, the hour, the, um, that we're almost to the end of two hours together. And so I think this is a good time for us to wrap up. And I, what I wanna say is that what I hoped to convey in this bar is that we really do have all the pieces to create these learning ecosystems. And the two things we need to organize them around for them to come into being are bioregions and the landscapes that need to be healed, and also the lifetime development processes of human beings, like the way that our daughter is three years old, so we're doing developmentally appropriate things as she's growing, that if we can structure education around our life choices for how we regenerate bioregions, and now as families, we make life choices as we change across the lifespan. But I think we'll get a lot of this right. And we really have a lot of deep knowledge and skills among us for how to do it. So for me, regenerative education is about learning to be human again. And as Gail was saying, eventually becoming indigenous for all of us. Those of us who are already indigenous, keep being indigenous. Those of us who once were, but forgot that we remember and become again. And if enough of us do this, then we can regenerate the planet and do it even in the midst of pretty terrible and scary collapse dynamics. So thank you all for the great questions and discussions, the great comment thread, um, for your presence and attention. And within about 10 minutes after this is over, the replay will be available to share. So, um, so you know, pass it around and share it with others. And join the study group if you're not already. Most of you are, I think. And let's keep discussions happening there. And um, let's rock and roll. This is, this is the work. Let's just keep doing it. So love to you all. Onward, fellow human.